Well, welcome everyone to CG seminar number 146, which is of course now in the webinar format. And we've got a very important topic today, which is the politics of tuition, which perhaps engages people more than any other single issue in higher education across the world. And the politics of tuition in the context of COVID-19 and this disruption of the normal compact between students and families uh, providers of education uh, mediated by the tuition arrangement and graduate employability. Um, I mean, is higher education primarily a, a private good or a public good? Or is it a mix of both? Or are those categories not helpful to us when we think about tuition? Should students pay during or after their degree? Uh, because their degree un unquestionably does generate lifelong benefits for them as individuals. Or is higher education better provided on the basis of no cost and universal access, like elementary education is in many countries, and that we recover the, uh, the user benefit through the taxation system later? What about tuition loan systems, which uh, where graduates repay the cost of their education uh, when their income reaches a threshold level, as in the UK and Australia? And what are the effects of tuition fees on access? That's a, pre, a, a perennial discussion. Um, now to discuss these important issues, we've got a great panel um, and we spread across the United States, the United Kingdom and Finland as a Nordic country with a free edu higher education system. I'll introduce our panelists successively as we go. Um, but first let's touch base with the, the web protocols I'll just bring it up on my screen. Bear with me, I'll get to it in a moment. Here we are. The uh, screen sharing system works very well if you're properly organized on your desktop, but when you're not like I am today, you have problems. Here we are, now we're gonna do it. Please note this uh, webinar is being recorded and we post the uh, recording of the webinar um, on our website, on the CG website, and subsequently winds up on YouTube. Uh, we also post the chat from the webinar, which is usually quite active. And that usually goes up first within the first 24 hours after the webinar. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar. But please do so when asking a question, it makes it more personal for all of us. We recommend using speaker view um, so you can more clearly see who's talking. To ask a question, use the chat function. Uh, write out the question you wish to ask. The earlier you put your question in the chat, the more likely you are that it will become part of the discussion. At the end of the three speakers, we'll then have the question and answer session. And if your question is selected, uh, you'll be invited to ask it directly in the webinar. So when you're invited, please unmute yourself. They're always the most important step. And then switch on your video and then state your name and where you were from. I'll now introduce our first speaker. Dr. Brian Pusser from the um, Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia, an Associate Professor of Higher Education at the Curry School, one of the best known experts on higher education in the United States. His research focuses on post-secondary policy, international and comparative higher education, political theories of higher education, and the organization and governance of post-secondary institutions in comparative perspective. Over to you, Brian and welcome. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and for organizing this wonderful series. <clears throat> and also thanks to Dr. Valima and Dr. Dearden for their participation 
and to all of those of you who have tuned in for the session, thank you. I'd like to do two things in the time I have today. I would like to share some thoughts on how to understand the politics of higher education, sketching a brief conceptual model with a citation for those of you who'd like to see that model in more detail. And I'd like to use that model to briefly introduce some examples of the ways in which the pandemic is shaping political contests in the United States over higher education. And I hope that will resonate in other national contexts. Before I continue, let me acknowledge the terrible tragedy that is the COVID-19 pandemic. To date, there are more than 14 million cases globally and over 600,000 deaths that we know of. So as I discuss today, the ways in which tuition and the finance of higher education are affected by the pandemic, I hope not to lose sight or in any way diminish the human tragedy of the pandemic as we discuss economics and markets, institutions and the like. So how should we understand the politics of higher education? Simply put, what I refer to as the politics of higher education is the contest for hegemony between the state, elements of the civil society, higher education institutions, and those actors outside of those formal designations. So this politics entails the exercise of power and their competing interests in each of these spheres. Because power is at the center, I argue for a critical approach to understanding the creation and persistence of the norms and understandings that have dominated research and scholarship in higher education on the politics of higher education. We need to better understand how power and interests drive the persistent and often taken for granted process of what Bachrock and Barrett's in the 1960s called the mobilization of bias that is at the center of political contest. Now, why tuition is charged and how much it costs and to whom it is charged drives highly contested political conflict because of the importance of higher education in state projects, the value it creates, and perhaps most of all, its symbolic importance in nearly every national context. Setting tuition is as much ideological, political, and cultural as it is an economic decision. And I think we've seen that uh, in many nations over the past four decades through neoliberal approaches to the finance of state institutions. So for those of you who wanna pursue this model in more detail and look at more of my work on the politics of higher education, I have a chapter in the latest edition of the handbook on the politics of higher education edited by Cantwell, Coates and King. And I'd highly recommend that volume to you on many, many levels. So let me now turn to some specific examples. Um, but I want to give you a quick note on my use of the word state today. I will refer to the state as it's used in political theory. But because I'm in the United States, where we have 50, 50 separate states, I'll use the phrase the individual states when referring to California, where I'm from, or Virginia, where I am now. So along with the health and safety of students and faculty and staff, perhaps the paramount concern in higher education in the United States today is over the ways in which the COVID-19 virus will shape inequality in access to higher education. The economic collapse, the decline in revenue for higher education that, that has accompanied the pandemic will disproportionately affect those individuals and communities which have been traditionally underserved in all stages of education in the United States and who will ultimately be underrepresented in higher education. The economic decline induced by the pandemic is a significant challenge also for undocumented students who have recently won court decisions favoring access, and I'll say a little bit more about them, but who have struggled to attain financial aid to support enrollment uh, throughout the past decade. Without concerted political action, it is virtually certain all these groups will be even further marginalized and underrepresented in decades to come. Now, the outcome of that political contest, as Simon mentioned, will turn on key understandings of the role of the state in higher education, of higher education as a public good, and particularly whether all people in the United States have a right to higher education. So another central question in the politics of the US today is, given the dangers of individual contact 
Should colleges open for face-to-face -face classes and residential life, or should we offer classes entirely online? President Trump and our Education Secretary DeVos have called for colleges to provide face-to-face -face instruction. And some scholars have argued this stance is consistent with their belief that the president's political future depends on reopening schools at every level. To that end, President Trump has stated he will withhold funding for colleges that don't open with face-to-face -face instruction. And you may be familiar with the directive he issued, since rescinded, to deny visas to international students who would not be able to take at least one class face-to-face. -face. In that case, the Democratic Party and other civil society organizations and such institutions as MIT and Harvard join the political struggle. Democrats in Congress have since introduced a bill to prevent retaliation against colleges that do not offer face-to-face -face instruction. So here we have a struggle within the state and between the state and its own institutions of higher education driven by the pandemic, which should significant numbers of international students turn away from the US or federal funds be reduced, have a significant impact on tuition revenue. So I'd like to share a couple more examples directly related to tuition, one that affects public colleges, one that affects private colleges. For public universities, the two most significant sources of revenue related to enrollment are direct payments from individual states and tuition revenue. They move together so that when one declines, the other historically increases. In the US, the pandemic has closed much of the economy and decreased the amount of tax revenue that support higher education. Students, higher education institutions, many associations in the civil society supporting higher education support sending federal revenue to the states to make up the shortfall. The alternative would be to raise tuition. Republicans in Congress and the Trump administration, uh, many of whom favor market approaches and neoliberal approaches to higher education, have so far declined to support increases in such funding. And this issue is sufficiently important politically to create an impasse on further stimulus legislation currently being debated in the Congress. For private universities, on the other hand, uh, some, they're seen as private enterprises and some private nonprofit universities and many for-profit universities did receive federal funding and tax credits in the first stimulus bill with support from business organizations in the civil society from the Trump administration. At the same time, many of those same interests that supported funding for private universities are hesitating to fully support public universities in order to enable them to reopen safely and effectively, which is another point of contention in the negotiations over a second stimulus bill. So I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about student debt, which has soared as tuition has increased over the past two decades. Students and formal and informal civil society organizations and, and many of the institutions of this, this became a significant part of the 2016 presidential campaign and in the primaries earlier this year. The urgency of the economic moment and driven by the pandemic will again impact the presidential election uh, where we'll have a significant divide between representatives of the Democratic Party, um, state agencies concerned with social welfare, um, economic organizations in the civil society, uh, and of course, students, parents, and others who are very concerned about student debt. It's also the case that the number of income contingent loans and investments in students are likely to rise as a result of the pandemic. And this is a relatively new phenomenon uh, in the United States, which has taken on, has accelerated recently, as many institutions have considered partnering with the private sector to offer income contingent loans, which I can say more about uh, when we come to the questions, if you'd like. But these contractual relationships may reduce tuition costs for individual students in the short run, they have enormous implications for how we understand affordability and human capital. And that's a particularly interesting topic for us to discuss, I think, going forward. 
I'll end with some thoughts on the potential risks to students from the virus. The pandemic has created a political struggle over who should be liable for the consequences of the virus on college campuses. Some states have given colleges blanket immunity from claims for damages caused by COVID-19. Other individual states offer immunity for institutions that have acted responsibly. Business interests in the civil society have supported this while those who represent individuals in liability litigation are pushing back strongly against blanket immunity through national associations and the media. Under the Trump administration, there are no clear guidelines from the Center for Disease Control or the administration on what responsible actions by colleges and universities during the pandemic would be. And civil society associations supporting higher education have lobbied intensively for some guidance. Parents and students, of course, want the safest environment, independent of liability. And in many cases, they're litigating and lobbying for lower tuition where all classes will be offered online. And I think that the questions that are raised about the value of face-to-face -face instruction and online are quite interesting and worth discussing in terms of the economic value of various forms of delivery, which has come to the fore in this moment in the United States as well. So in sum, what the pandemic has done to the political life of the United States has been to force immediate and difficult deliberations and decisions over public and private goods, individualism and collective action, capitalism and well-being, equality and social mobility, the role of the state, the civil society, and higher education institutions themselves in ensuring the future of higher education. And all of this is taking place in a context in which each of these long-standing political contests is now also a matter of life and death. So I think I'll stop there and, and turn it back over to you, Simon. Oh, thank you, Brian, for that outstanding summary of uh, issues. And it does appear that many of the issues that you're wrestling with in the United States are being wrestled with here in the United Kingdom as well. And some of them, I think, resonate quite broadly, especially those related to economic value of different kinds of delivery and what we do about um, resumption of classes in the next academic year. That's a problem which is, which is concerning many in the Northern Hemisphere right now. Um, my pleasure now to introduce Lorraine Dearden. She's a valued colleague in the Centre for Global Higher Education. Uh, Lorraine is Professor of Economics and Social Statistics in the Department of Social Science at the Institute of Education and University College London. Um, she's a research fellow also in the education sector at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. And she's been a participant, a leader of many major studies in relation to financing and equity in higher education. Um, her research focuses on the impact of education and training on labor market outcomes, company performance, evaluation of education and labor market policies, impact of month of birth on childhood and adult outcomes, income support for students, evaluation of childcare, home and learning environments, and many other related issues. Lorraine, um, welcome, and we look forward to your contribution on the politics of COVID-19 and tuition. Uh, thanks, Simon, for that, that introduction, and thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. Um, so I'm going to focus, I've done a lot of work on higher education financing in, in England and around the world, and um, I just thought as introduction to our international colleagues, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the English system, although parts of it has applications in the United Kingdom more generally. But the English system involves having pretty high fees, uh, currently around 9,250 a year for undergraduate study. Um, uh, um, but nobody needs to pay this fee up front because everybody who is from the United Kingdom and currently Europe studying in an English university has access to an income contingent loan. So 95% of students studying at an English university will take out 
an English, uh, an income contingent loan. So in England, there are significant fees, but for most students, there's absolutely no upfront costs in terms of fees, and they can also get loans for living costs. So university is not free, but it's free at the point of access. And then if a student uh, decides to take out a loan, then the student loan company will pay the fees directly to the university. And that is a very significant uh, source of funding for English universities, the fees they get from um, domestic students. So, um, so it's a sort of a different, it's, it's not, like the Finnish system being completely free and it, it, it's different um, um, to the US system. So, um, but basically with these income contingent loans because fees are so high, uh, the, the system in England is that you do not start repaying this loan until you earn just over 26,000 pounds a year, which is just above average earnings, okay? Um, so it means that these loans involve significant taxpayer subsidies. Around 45% of the loan value is never repaid. So, so you know, there, there is a taxpayer subsidy, but the taxpayer subsidy is largest for those who do badly in the labor market. And actually those who do well in the labor market pay more, you know, you know 120% of their, their, you know, of what their tuition was. So it's a redistributive uh, system. Um, um, I've got my son knocking on the door. Uh, it's, he's, he's just gone. So it, 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 it's a progressive system with taxpayer subsidies, but uh, uh, very different to a loan system in the US. So in the US, a typical loan is, is more like a mortgage, a time-based repayment loan, so the Stafford loan system, which uh, lots of students take out, generally involves taking a loan and then repaying it over a set period, um, and regardless of how much you earn. Um, so Brian mentioned that increasingly in the US, um, income contingent loans are being more used, but they are very different to the system in the UK. In the UK, if you lose your job, you do nothing because the loan is paid by employer withholding. So, so every month, if you're not in a job and earning the equivalent of £26,000 a year, you pay nothing. If you are earning in that month over £26,000, your employer will take off the tax and the student loan repayment, which is 9% above every pound earned above the threshold. So it's automatic. There's, the, the borrower does nothing, absolutely nothing. Whereas in the, U, in the US, you, it's based on retrospective information. You have to, it's quite an administrative hassle and that there's a nasty sting in the tail if you don't repay your load at the end. So this income contingent loans and sort of significant fees were first introduced, well, fees were first introduced in 1998, but, but uh, uh, the income contingent loan for fees first came in in 2006 when fees were around £3,000 per year. And what the introduction of fees has uh, done is actually allowed university funding per student, All the, virtually all universities in, in the UK are public universities, the funding per head for students has sin increased significantly. It's almost doubled since when we had free higher education. So it's meant that funding for universities has increased significantly. The second thing it's allowed, because the taxpayer uh, contribution uh, hasn't gone up, it's in fact slightly gone down in real terms, is it's allowed the, the system to get bigger at no extra cost. And the people who have benefited the most from that are those from poor socioeconomic backgrounds. The participation by those from the lowest socioeconomic background has basically doubled since the introduction of fees, whereas at the top there's virtually been no change. So, so this is a hybrid model where where you come, you know, there's no upfront cost, and then how much you contribute to your higher education depends on how well you do in the labor market. With those who are doing the best 
cross subsidizing those who don't. So, so the COVID, I think, you know, illustrating with the, the COVID uh, disaster, I've got a son who's just finished university. He took out a student loan for all his fees and living costs. You know, he hasn't got a job, uh, which, you know, is a, is a worry. It's something he has to worry about. But one thing he does not have to consider is how he's going to pay his student loan. It, it's just not an issue. So, so the insurance mechanism of an income contingent loan means that despite the many worries that graduates have at the moment, one of them is not how they're going to pay their loan. Unlike the situation in the US where, uh, you know, people will start defaulting, have ruined credit reputations, and it will impact really badly for the, the rest of their lives. So, um, there's, there's other similar issues. I mean, you know, universities are quite worried about what's going to uh, happen now. And some universities, particularly those who rely on large numbers of high fee paying overseas students, um, are, you know, are, are worried about how much money they're going to get. And so, and a, a report done by colleagues of mine at the Institute for Fiscal Studies suggests that you know, around 20 universities are really going to be facing bankruptcy unless there's some sort of help from government. So there, there are similar issues. And I, you know, I think every university is a bit unsure about how it's going to impact on its uh, finances and the government's thinking about sort of capping places and other mechanisms, which I'm sure people in this audience know a lot better than me. So, um, so I think there's lots of similarities, you know, we've got issues about, you know, that there's demands by students in the UK about whether fees should go down because I think most universities will be providing most online, uh, it will be, be doing online provision of uh, lectures next year. There's lots of similar issues, but um, the, the impact on, ta you know, limited taxpayer resources, which, you know, the, the COVID uh, um, disaster is, is going to impact on all sorts of spending, will, will not impact on universities as much as, say, in the US, I would imagine. I'll leave it there, Simon, and maybe people can come back for questions. Well, thanks, Lorraine. It's a fabulous uh, explanation of, think, of a complex system to most, most who are not familiar with it, I think, and you've made it very clear to everyone how it works. Um, it's now a delight to invite in UC Belima. UC is the um, Professor in Educational Studies and Director of the Finnish Institute for Educational Research at the University of Javascula in Finland. He originally an historian by training. He works on the social science and cultural aspects of higher education. He's a very well published author in relation to those domains. Um, he's interested in the relationship between higher education and society. And as such has uh, focused on the Nordic model of higher education has played a significant role in bringing the explanation of the Nordic systems to the rest of the world. Uh, his most recent um, publication is a book, which is a history of Finnish higher education from the Middle Ages to the 21st century, which you can read in English through Springer, and you can also read in Finnish. He's published it in both languages. Yusi, your take on the tuition, politics of tuition and COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for your nice introduction and, and thank everybody for, for attending this, this uh, panel. Uh, I think I, I need to uh, need to say something about the Finnish system before I, I, I go to the discussing the the COVID and and the politics of tuition. Uh, there has it has been said that there is a more Nordic model with five variations, uh, meaning that when you look at the, the Nordic countries from outside, they look quite homogeneous, but uh, when you look at inside, they they are quite different. Uh, what is common to all Nordic countries is the, the strong uh, role uh, played by the, uh, by the state. And when I say state, I mean a nation state and, and nation state of Finland. Uh, 
And th this is the case also in Finland, where the, our Minister of Education is, and Culture uh, is, is the strongest actor in the field of higher education policy. Uh, not only through allocation of resources, about two thirds of the funding of universities come fr uh, comes from the budget of Minister of Education and Culture, uh, but it also issues orders and prepares legislation for the parliament. Uh, and I think I should say that about 95% of the, of the funding of Finnish uh, higher education is based on different kind of public sources, whether not only Minister of Education, but uh, Finnish Academy, European Union, foundations, etc. cetera. Uh, and what is also typical to Nordic countries is, is that uh, there is a strong institutional autonomy for institutions of higher education together with a strong uh, steering of the, uh, of the state. And this is seen as a natural order of things in, in Nordic countries. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons for that is that there is a high trust in society in Nordic countries. So Minister of Education, trust in universities and vice versa. Uh, common to all Nordic countries is also the fact that education and including higher education is not seen as a commodity but it's more like a citizen's right for high quality education. So we don't think about higher education and the decrease in economic terms or mainly in economic terms. Uh, I think I also should say that at the moment we have the, the most left-wing coalition government for more than 20 years in Finland. Uh, uh, parties from political center to, uh, to political left are, are included and, and, and the Green Party. And this uh, government strongly emphasizes the importance of education and equal education opportunities for all. And in fact, this is the, the traditional policy perspectives to, uh, to, high, to education and higher education. When uh, the, the Nordic welfare state has been built in Finland from 1960s to 1990s. And this may also uh, help to understand why the, uh, the policy actions taken during the, uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, then something shortly about the, the Finnish system of education. Uh, I think that it, we should remember that, uh, that the, the strength of the Finnish system is not necessarily high education, but it's the good basic education because this good basic education gives equal educational opportunities for every citizen to continue their studies uh, after basic education, whether it's uh, vocational, professional, or, or academic. And there are no dead ends, no matter what you do after uh, basic education or primary education, you, you can always continue your studies uh, further. Uh, and as Lorraine already mentioned, uh, the education is, is free of charge in Finland. All education is free of charge in Finland, including higher education. But it's not only for, for Finnish students, but also students from European Union and European Economic Area, because we we uh, apply the same rules for, for all European students. Uh, there are two sectors in, in higher education, uh, universities and, and universities of applied sciences. The main difference is, is that universities award all degrees, bachelor's, master's and PhDs, whereas uh, uh, universities of applied sciences, they uh, award only bachelor degrees and their orientation is more like developing local working life, whereas universities do basic and fundamental research. And I think I also should say that there, there is no institutional status hierarchy in Finnish higher education. And I know that this is uh, my colleagues from outside Finland find it hard to believe this argument, but it's true. And uh, there, are, uh, uh, there, there is good uh, empirical evidence of that. But if I, if I uh, use this one, and, and say that uh, that students' fut uh, future success in working life does not depend on the higher education institution where he or she has studies, but uh, but it's related to the discipline or field uh, which uh, he or she has, has studied. Uh, so, 
there are state of differences related to fields and, and disciplines. Uh, and there is quite hard competition for, for the most popular fields like medicine, law, business, political science and teacher education. Uh, I also should say that Finland has a, a universal system because study place is offered to about 70% of the cohort of, of, the, of the relevant age cohort. However, because of the, the high competition for, for popular fields, uh, access is not easy. There are normally three times more students ap applying for, for studies in higher education than there are st uh, starting places in, 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 in higher education institutions. So this was more like the context. And then about the tuition fees and, and student support. Uh, Studying after basic education is not only free of charge, but it's also supported by the state. Uh, the support of higher education studies consists of three uh, elements, which I try to illustrate. The first one is study grant. Uh, and study grant can be paid for 49 months, uh, which corresponds to six uh, years studies in higher education, nine months a year. Academic, uh, academic year. Uh, for example, if a, a 20 years old single uh, student, I call her Mary, because majority of Finnish uh, high education students are, are females, uh, Mary may receive 253 year, euros a month if she studies and if she's uh, not living with her parents. Uh, students with children and, and, and spouse may, may get more, more uh, may get a bigger grant. The second element is housing supplement uh, for rental costs. For example, uh, if Mary uh, uh, lives in a rental uh, apartment uh, with the rent of, of 400 euros a month, she may uh, receive uh, support for 382 euros. I made these calculations based on, 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 the, on the existing data. The third uh, uh, form of support is a state guarantee for study loan, which is uh, state guarantees is for 650, uh, 650 euros per month. So during your studies, you may take state supported loan about 32,000 euros. If Mary, again, has taken a student loan and she graduates within the target time, which is five years or depending on the, on the field in, in medicine, it's much longer. The state can pay off as much as a third of her loan in the form of student loan compensation. Uh, so as you can see, the, the, the financial support uh, for students in Finland is conditional. Uh, a student must make a progress in one's studies to be granted uh, public financial aid. Minimum number of study cre uh, credits is 20 credits in an academic year, which actually is not very much. Uh, the assumption is that you study 60 study credits in a year. Uh, and in addition, there is a, stu a student meal subsidy for all students. So in student restaurants, you may pay about about two and a half euros for a full meal. Uh, what, is, what our statistics don't show is, is that how many uh, part-time students we have in Finland because that category is missing. But if a student uh, studies less than 30 uh, study credits, it's, uh, it's assumed to be a part-time student. Um, so a uh, quite big number of our students also work during their studies. Uh, and, and, and that reduces the, the public support for their studies. Finally, uh, about COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, I think uh, that I'm, I belong to, to one of the, the lucky people in, on, on the earth because uh, Finland is, is one of the countries which has suffered the least from, from, uh, from this pandemic, at least so far. Uh, and one of the major, major reasons is the fact that, that, uh, that the Finnish government and the Finnish society uh, took the pandemic really seriously. The country was locked down from March to June and a large majority of, of citizens followed carefully the instructions given by the government. 
So in this sense, uh, the Finnish citizens uh, appreciate public goods, a uh, good of the nation more than the individual rights or private good. Uh, as for higher education, all higher education institutions were locked down on March and they are still locked down. For example, I have not been working in my office uh, after March 13. Uh, and there was a, a digital jump uh, uh, from face-to-face -face teaching to the online teaching basically overnight. So uh, all the teaching went, went, uh, went uh, online um, uh, in a couple of days. Uh, during during the when the pandemic was it, when, it, uh, when the pandemic fever or the, the the fear of the pandemic was its highest uh, highest point, there was a suggestion of the group of economists uh, to introduce tuition fees to Finnish students to 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 increase the, the revenues for education. But this suggestion was uh, was not really publicly debated and it was silenced to death. So no popularity for that. Uh, in addition to, to, to universities, there are open universities and open polytechnics in every Finnish higher education institution. In April, all open universities and polytechnics decide, decided to open their courses and studies for all citizens free of charge to help uh, people ad adjust to the COVID pandemic. And this was quite significant higher education policy decision, even though the fees in, in open universities are quite modest. There are about 10 euros per study credit. So if you study one year in open university, uh, it costs 600 euros. Uh, and the plan is to ex expand this open university route to higher education in, in the future. So, so that as many as 10 to 15% of the students will, will have access to higher education through that route. And simultaneously, uh, all higher education institutions uh, increase their, their uh, student intake for, for next academic year about 7%. And in order to respond to increased demand for higher education. Uh, this, but this was not only caused by, by the pandemic because, uh, because the, the increase is a national, uh, was a national aim before pandemic, but it really uh, clearly speeded up the, the process. Um, and it's also related to changes in the, in the, in the reform of student intake. I will not go further with that. So to sum up, uh, I could say that um, that higher education is continuously understood and maybe even stronger as a public good than it was before the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, there has been a debate in Finland uh, on the relationship between economy and, and health, and, and, and it has been quite uh, uh, commonly accepted that, that health is more important than economy, even though this will be highly debated, uh, I think, from, from this onward. And COVID and this pandemic has not changed the dynamics or, and goals of and for higher education in Finland uh, because high quality of, of basic education, higher education and research is, is seen vital for the, for the future of this small Nordic nation state. Thank you. Thank you, Yussi, for that wonderful explanation. Um, very clear. Uh, I think we haven't got a lot of time left. So I think the way we'll now proceed is um, I'm going to ask you see a question. Then we're going to bring in two members of the participant members of the webinar to ask a question of Brian and Lorraine about um, uh, the relative pricing of online and face-to-face -face higher education. And then if we've got time, we'll bring in Bruce Chapman, the inventor of uh, income contingent loans, who's in the webinar and may want to say something about income contingent loans and other matters. So you see my, my question for you is this, just in relation to international students or foreign students, I understand that Finland has proceeded to establish a fee-based arrangement governing foreign students. Yeah. Um, you, could you tell us about that briefly and what proportion of your students are foreign students? How many people would be affected? Well, uh... If you mean foreign students, uh, students coming from outside European economic area. Yes. Yeah. So 
and and they 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 need to be a, a pay a, a student fee, which is the maximum sum is, is seven thousand euros or a, an academic year. But there are uh, different uh, scholarship systems in in every university, so that there are actually very few students who who really pay the the, the full amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the the number of 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 uh, international uh, students, um, I don't remember it it quite precisely. It, before pandemic, it was about five percent, mm -hmm. and it, certainly it's it's less than that now. So it's really it, it, the the fee was was introduced a couple of years ago, and and the student numbers really fall uh, because of of this intro mm -hmm. introduction of student tuition fees. Thank you very much. Now, at this point, I'd like to bring in two questions that from the participant audience, which are both about the topic of the relative prices of online and face to face. And I'm going to ask Brian and Lorraine to each answer these questions. But first, let's bring in the questions um, from Diana Laurelard and Hong Bui. And Diana, can you come in first and give us your question, please? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for some great presentations. They're really informative. Um, so my question is, what would be the reason for reducing tuition for an online course when it takes more teacher time to develop and run? At least initially it does. Sometimes you can amortize that over larger student numbers or more runs, but it, it does take a lot more time. And then when it's properly managed, it actually has many beneficial effects for the students. And there are no obvious short-term savings on the estate. I mean, all of our universities which have switched to online still have to maintain their estate. It makes no difference to that. So there would be none of those kinds of reasons. So what would be the reason for reducing tuition for online courses? So, Thank you, um, Diana. So before you answer, I'm going to bring in a second question on the same topic uh, from um, Hong Bui, who's uh, got a, a related but different question about relative pricing. So. Hong, could you come in, please? Thank you very much, Sam, and, and all speakers for, for your, your insight into US, UK, and in its uh, higher education. My question here is that uh, students ask for reduction of their tuition fee because they argue that um, they have less in-person contact with their lecturers. Uh, but in contrast, uh, lecturers have to spend more time on preparing and delivering online teaching. And not only that, they have to comfort our distance students make sure they are okay. And you know, the online teaching is not and should not be massive teaching, but tailor-made ones. But in reality, uh, academics are losing jobs, you know, across a number of countries that I've been observing. So why, you know, which party should we, we're talking about politics in, in tuition fee, so which parties that should we accommodate? You know, not only in, in higher education, but in terms of nationals, international uh, government, you know, that, that level, so which party should be accommodated? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, colleagues, you, you, you see the, the problem that Hong Bu is pointing out. She's saying that, look, uh, on one hand, the students get less product. On the other hand, the costs are greater uh, and staff have more to do and so on. So in terms of a cost argument and a value argument, they seem to be working contrarily. Now, can, I wonder if we could ask Brian to answer that, those two questions and then go to Lorraine. Brian. Yeah, I'll try to be brief about that. These are really good questions. Uh, thank you for that. Um, with regard to, to the, the, the litigation over uh, reducing fees because of online delivery, um, two things about it. One is your, que your question was very informed and the questions in general are very informed. And, and I think that those of us who study higher ed know more about the relative costs of online delivery and the time involved and so forth than does the, does the wider population. Um, but I think there's a more important sort of cultural and maybe socially capitally, so, driven by, socially, by social capital explanation that we could use, which is that um, in, in the United States, much of the higher education is seen as what Simon has referred to very effectively as a positional good. Um, and that when students choose colleges and particularly selective colleges, they're interested in small class sizes, in close contact with faculty, in building networks with professionals who can advance their careers with letters of recommendation and so forth. And so I think it's that positionality, that positional good aspect 
uh, of, of higher education that those who are bringing litigation, those who feel there should be discounts, see as something of which they're being uh, deprived in the process of moving to online in, in a related way to demands for return of portions of housing fees and residential life fees uh, and activity fees, all of which they see as, as not ancillary, but central to the college experience. And I think that's what's driving. It's another challenge we face with selective institutions and higher education as, as a positional good. Um, and then just quickly to the question about who should absorb the costs um, of the increasing challenge for lecturers and others. Um, Obviously, this should be a widely shared cost um, within institutions um, with support from the civil society, with support from the state. Um, but in fact, it'll probably uh, depend on the power of labor uh, and the relative power of organizational capital to make those determinations about where the costs are born and where the benefits go, as is often the case in the United States higher education. Thank, thanks, Brian. Uh, Lorraine. Um, well, I, I feel very nervous talking about this issue when Diana is probably a world expert on uh, delivery of online content. I mean, uh, um, I, I, I think this, uh, I, I don't think reductions in fees are the answer. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it'd be a danger long term for universities going bust. Um, and I think you know, it, it, it's not, a, uh, I agree with you. I think, you know, we, we have to just work very hard to make sure that the provision is as good as possible. Realizing that university education happens over three years and hopefully this is a temporary problem. Um, so, but, but, you know, you are the expert on this, not me. So I, you know, I, 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 I defer to you, but your view is fees should not change. Uh, it, I mean, I just think it would create more problems than it would solve. I, I agree that students will feel very short change, but it, I think it's in terms of us all pulling together, because it, even if fees stay the same, universities in the United Kingdom are going to be losing revenue and some very, very significantly so and at risk of folding completely. So I think as part of us all sharing the pain, uh, not reducing fees is a better the best solution, but uh, I defer to you, Diana, you you know about this more than me. At, at this point, um, I'd like to bring in Bruce Chapman. Uh, de de delightful to have Bruce in the webinar. And after Bruce, we'll uh, have Pedro Tixera. Bruce. Hello. Bruce, you'll have to unmute to come in if you're there. Maybe we've lost him. Uh, if Bruce comes back, that will bring him in in the 10 minutes we have left. But Pedro, would you like to ask your question at this um, point? Am I unmuted? Ah, uh, there's Bruce. Hello, am I, am I there? Yes, we can hear you now, so it's far away. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Simon, so much for organising this. I'd like to make two comments about the economics of this uh, issue uh, on tuition. One which is generic, it's general, and one which is about uh, COVID-19. So can you nod if you're hearing me, Simon? I'm just mm -hmm. not sure. Okay. The first point is, as Lorraine has said, but needs to be reinforced, it is inequitable if there are no charges for university. It's ex an extremely important point that um, the people who are privileged by university education when it's so-called free, that is paid by all taxpayers, are very advantaged. And it's a really weird thing. I, I know you, Simon, you're a lefty, and I'm a lefty too. But we probably agree that it's very progressive uh, economic policy to have a tuition charge uh, so long as people are able to pay it. And this is the most important point of all. As Lorraine has suggested, 
having um, a student loan system which is income contingent is completely fundamental. It means it protects everybody uh, who enrols, there's no charge, and everything is determined by what happens in the future. So um, my first point is, let's not talk about the fairness of that tuition charging it is completely fair and reasonable that the people who benefit from um, the huge advantage pay something, but it has to be in a way that works and it protects them. And that's why Lorraine's other point is so important, income contingent loans, they protect people. If you enrol without charge, you don't have to pay until you've got a certain and high level of income. That's the first point and it should never be forgotten. The second point is about COVID. This is the most extraordinary experience for graduates, recent graduates and currently enrolled students, because the people who are in student loan systems in which they have to pay back their debt, no matter what their circumstances, in the next few years, they are in deep, deep trouble. It's a terrible, terrible thing for recent graduates or current students in the United States and Canada and many other places where they have student loans that they have to pay back even if they have no money. Income contingent loans solve the problem. It is so important. It means that there is no current graduate uh, or student in Australia or in the UK or um, New Zealand who should be at all worried about student loan. You know, what's, loans, you know what's going on in the US and Canada and other places? There are tens of millions of people who are really, really in trouble because of their anxiety, because of the decimation of their labour markets, because they've got student loan systems, which mean they have to repay no matter what their circumstances. If there is one big point that comes from this whole discussion is please, please, please have student loan systems which are contingent on capacity to pay. It's the only way to protect people. And by developing such a system in Australia in the late 1980s, Bruce introduced a concept into social policy, which really wasn't there in an active way before. The idea had been around for longer, I think, Bruce, but you operationalised it in a medium-sized country. And as a result, it's now spread to a number of other countries with, through the efforts of yourself and Lorraine and, and others in part. Um, so it's an enormous change and it created a whole uh, aspect to our discussion today, whereby we have market systems, we have free systems, and in between we have income contingent loan systems, which seem to combine some features of both. Um, and of course, um, are attractive to, to governments that have robust tax systems and can make the repayments work and that's still currently a bit of an issue in the in the United Kingdom, I must say, although Australia seems to be managing the repayment problem and its costs to the public purse pretty well. Um, at this point, uh, we are running out of time, but we've got a little bit more. I'm going to ask Pedro Tixira to come in, and then I think we'll have a short one-minute uh, closing statement from all, each of our speakers. Pedro, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Simon. Thank you to all the panelists. It's been a very, very stimulating session. Um, the question that I have is, um, well, I was listening to your presentations and I was wondering, well, we can make uh, a discussion about tuition fees and where tuition fees are going, uh, focusing on contextual issues in the, the sort of the political and social environment and the way that it's influenced past uh, changes. But, and, and then we can also make an argument in terms of the internal or the internal politics or policies in higher education, sort of the different positions of the stakeholders, the rationales and sort of the, in a sense, a more um, uh, rational discussion about this. I, I, was, I was wondering how much each of these you think will influence the debate in your countries, um, how much will be the, the potential shifts in the political environment that will affect many areas of public policy and also tuition fees? Or do you think this will still be very much an internal discussion within higher education? So can we I have the opportunity to answer that question, I think, as the closing statement. So, Brian, yes. 
Okay, I would just quickly say hello, Pedro, and um, thank you for a really good question as usual. Um, I would just say that um, in this case, it's, it's ultimately decided in the political realm in the United States, but the internal and the external are inextricably linked. Um, and so to give you an example, um, the idea that students should bear higher, higher uh, proportion of the cost of higher education, that it was a private, it had private benefits that should be borne by private payers, really began in um, academic scholarship from Hayek through Friedman, um, became, became generated internally in higher education and knowledge production, and then it was picked up at the Hoover Institution and then with Ronald Reagan and Milton Friedman um, expanded to Chile and elsewhere as an external political project, um, which then reinforced those internal dialogues, policies and regulatory practices. So I, so I think that it's really the interaction of both over time that shapes the changes. Um, right now, I think it's going to be a combination of a, a, a very neoliberal state in the United States uh, competing with a great deal of protest in the civil society over loans and debt, and, and we're going to see more direct confrontation in the short term. Thanks, Brian. Lorraine. I don't Lorraine. have um, very much more to add to that. I, I, the, the politics of this is, is very important. I'm doing lots of work in South America and in you know, uh, places like Chile, where they've got huge taxpayer funding problems, and they have an elite free higher education system, but the access to that is by the, 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 you know, the, be the best off because they do well in the, the private exams. You know, the politics of this is really important. And, you know, I'm working in Colombia and trying to get changes. Their student loan system is in an absolute crisis. Everybody knows they should switch to an income contingent loan. We've shown it can be done. But the politics and the vested interests make it very difficult. So, you know, it, 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 it's complicated and politics uh, it governs a lot of things, even when, you know, you can demonstrate that everybody would be better off. Indeed. Um, and... You see, you have the last word. <laughs> what an honor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Petro, for your, for your excellent question. Uh, I think that, well, these internal and external uh, uh, issues are, uh, are related. So they are tied to interrelated. They are tied to, to, to each other. Uh, uh, Answering from, from a Finnish point of view, I think that the, the externalist uh, view is, is dominant in Finland. And this is related to, the, to our national tradition when, when education and higher education has really built this nation. The Finnish nationalism is based on, on, on education more, or was created by, by education. Uh, and it's also related to the, to the success story of, of, the, of the welfare state and, and the building knowledge society in Finland. So education, research, universities, education is really seen important for the, for the future of the, of the nation. So that's why it's, it's very hard to introduce the idea of tuition fees into this context where uh, we, we see clearly that, that higher education is a public good. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I want to thank all three speakers. I mean, your initial um, statements are tremendously helpful, I think, in, in different ways, and, um, and your participation in the, in the discussion equally so. And can I thank Pedro for his excellent question, Bruce for coming in with such words of wisdom, and Huang Bui and Diana uh, for also joining us. I apologise to David Law, whose question was slightly off topic, but I'm sure we'll hear from David in future webinars. Colleagues, if I could be allowed a, a, a very brief reflection. We heard today from a political scientist who's working in, in higher education studies, uh, an economist who works in an education institute um, and, an, and an economic research centre, and an historian and sociologist. Um, and all three of them uh, brought these different disciplinary sensibilities to the common issue of, um, of COVID-19 and tuition. And all three show that their disciplines provide powerful ways of understanding the world. But we all end up talking about much the same political problems, don't we? Um, the issue of COVID-19 and tuition will not go away 
at the end of this uh, session. I'm sure we'll be, we'll be coming back to it in future webinars when we recommence um, in September and October. Um, and uh, next week, we'll have a webinar on Thursday, which will talk about uh, COVID-19 and graduate employment and unemployment, which is looming as a very large issue given the, the depth of the recession in most countries. Also next week on Tuesday in our next webinar, we have a, a discussion of cross-sectoral relations in the, in the UK, particularly in England. Um, the question of a pro possible rebalancing between higher education and further education, possibly funding shifts between the sectors. Those issues are entertaining government right now in the UK and we expect that um, that'll be quite a hot topic for, for our UK <sighs> listeners next week. Um, so thank you all. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week and thanks again to our wonderful presenters. Please come back again.